This is a brief analysis of Wilfred Owen's poem, Futility. Uh, structurally, the poem has 14 lines and is divided into two stanzas of seven lines each. Uh, traditionally, a sonnet would have uh, eight lines, an octave and a sextet, eight lines and then six lines, octave, sextet, um, or uh, the English sonnet might have uh, your three quatrains followed by a couplet. So this poem doesn't adhere to the, uh, to the structure of a sonnet in any way other than the fact that it is 14 lines long. So it's probably not a sonnet. We would probably just call it an elegy. An elegy is a lyrical poem that's used to celebrate uh, the death of someone or something great, the passing of someone or something great. And they're usually much longer than this 14 lines. But this, uh, we could say that this is still an elegy. But in a typical Wilfred Owen fashion, he has uh, subverted what we expect from an elegy. And instead of it being a celebration of someone great, it's a celebration of an ordinary soldier. And the way in which that soldier is celebrated is uh, more to highlight the atrocity of war and the pity of war rather than the greatness of the soldier himself. Uh, the poem deals with the content matter of a soldier who is trying to be revived or, or more of a uh, unit trying to revive a particular soldier that's in their unit. And they're trying to revive him by moving him into the sun and hoping that that will somehow rescue him. We have a number of uh, conflicts that are happening uh, throughout the poem. So we have the literal conflict that's happening in terms of World War I. Uh, we also have uh, a broader, um, more, I guess, metaphysical conflict that's happening between good and evil. And um, that's personified through the sun and the snow, the sun being something good and the snow being uh, something corrupt. Uh, we have the innocence of the soldier and the experience or the corruption of death, all of those um, conflating together in this poem. So starting with the title, uh, the poem was originally titled Frustration. Wilfred Owen felt that the word frustration gave a sense that there was a difficulty which could be overcome, that we're frustrated now, but we might have success later. Whereas futility just gives a sense that there will never be success. Uh, also, the sound of futility has that F then T, which is almost like a spitting noise, uh, spitting in disgust at the way that these soldiers have been treated. In the opening line, we have uh, the direct command, move him into the sun. So this seems to be uh, being said by one of the soldiers on the ground, um, looking at this other soldier uh, who has passed away and trying to revive him, to resurrect him. We then, in the second stanza, get another command, think how it wakes the seeds. But this command seems to be focused more on the people at home, more on the home front than on the immediate situation of trying to revive the soldiers. This is something that happens in Wilfred Owen's Anthem for Doomed Youth, where in that sonnet he has the two rhetorical questions that uh, begin each stanza, the octave and sextet in that instance. Uh, so what passing bells for these who die as cattle, and then uh, what candles may be held to speed them all with the second stanza really focusing on the home front, whereas the first stanza focuses on the battlefield. So move him into the sun uh, is the direct command. Uh, Gently its touch awoke him once. So beginning with the sounds, we have the uh, repeated W sound, that consonance of the what, 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 uh, whispering of fields half sown. Uh, we almost get a W, not quite with sown. Uh, and then the repetition of woke him. W along with Y, Y and W are our two semi-vowels in the English language. And so they're not quite a vowel, not quite a consonant. And that reflects the fact that this soldier is not quite alive, not quite dead, that we're trying to resurrect him, that he's in some uh, space in between life and death. And it uh, reinforces the tension that we have between good and evil, uh, innocence and corruption throughout the poem. So gently it's touch, here the sun is being personified, as we said earlier, that we've got the personification of the sun. Gently it's touch awoke him once, at home. And so at home we get a sense of distance, a sense of memory, that we're, there was a time before this war, that uh, we again have this dichotomy, this time between uh, the battlefield and the home front. At home, whispering of fields half sown. 
Okay, and then so we have the repetition of that O sound, so the assonance really of that O sound. Let's get a better color for that than red. Let's go with yellow, um, half sewn. So the assonance of those long, elongated vowel sounds, those empty vowel sounds, whispering of fields, half sewn. The fact that the fields are half sewn um, refers to the innocence of this uh, young soldier, that they're only just beginning uh, their life and that it's being cut short. Uh, so it's a metaphor really. The, the fields are uh, a metaphor of life where things are going to grow but they're not fully sown, they're only half sown. Always, great word there, always, we get that sense of certainty. Always, it woke him. Even in France, okay, so we have the, again, that juxtaposition or the dichotomy between home and France of being um, abroad and being somewhere comfortable. Even in France, until this morning, so always gets cut short by this caveat, um, until this morning and this snow. So we have that repetition of this um, in uh, line five here. And so that really adds emphasis, not to the word this, but what comes after it, this morning and this snow. And so we're really juxtaposing the idea of morning, which is sort of the idea of a new dawn, uh, new opportunities, a new day, uh, things uh, really having a sense of rebirth and growth. Uh, but that's juxtaposed against the snow and snow having a sense of the world being quiet and the world being dead as in a winter. And so those two ideas, those co two conflicting ideas um, being uh, put against each other, both in their proximity within the same line, but also through the repetition of this. If anything might rouse him now, so we've gone from always to anything, um, that really definite high modality language of always to now, if anything might rouse him, so they're really clutching at straws, might rouse him now, the kind old son will know. Um, yeah, the kind old son. We have that personification of the sun again, um, whereas before it was gently its touch. It does have this uh, grandfatherly feel or grandmotherly feel even, um, that the sun is wise, it's old, it's kind, it's gentle, and it's something that's going to really um, caress and uh, embrace this soldier and really uh, nurse him back to health and back to, back to life. Um, but of course, this is not what happens. Um, we have this word as well, rouse, um, which is an interesting word here. The rouse is a military term, and no doubt um, Wilfred Owen was playing on its meaning. It's the song that gets played after the last post uh, on commemoration services, on Remembrance Day or Armistice Day services um, all around the world. Uh, so the kind old son will know. If we just take a moment to note the rhyme scheme, we have sun, once, sown, France, snow, now, no. And so we can see that the first couple of lines really don't rhyme particularly well. Um, sun, once, sown, snow, France, once. Um, but then we get snow, with no, and so we do have this perfect rhyme, whereas before it was all just slant rhyme. And so the perfect rhyme gives a sense of completion, and uh, tragically and pathetically, it gives a sense of completion to uh, the life of this soldier that it is now at an end. Um, so that's no, sorry, not with now, um, but with snow is where we get that sense of uh, completion and end of their life. Moving into the second stanza, where uh, we as people at the home front are commanded to think how it wakes the seeds. And so we get this agricultural imagery as well. Um, this agricultural imagery uh, that was uh, first introduced in the whispering of fields half sown earlier. Woke once the clays of a cold star. So most commentaries have star here meaning planet. So uh, woke once the clays of a cold earth. Star gives a sense of real distance. Uh, stars are very, very small, very, very distant and white. And so it's not only cold in terms of uh, it being winter or cold as when the earth was first formed, perhaps it was cold, um, but also a sense of distance. Uh, yeah. 
Woke once. Again, we get that um, alliteration of the W sound. Woke once. The clays. Uh, clay is really important here. Uh, it will return uh, down there in our third last line. And it's a biblical illusion that in the King James Version of the Bible, um, God was said to have built uh, people from the clay. And so it's that idea in the uh, Anglican um, prayer book version of a funeral, with which Wilfred Owen would have been intimately familiar, um, that uh, it's that idea of ashes to ashes, from dust we were made and to dust we will return. Um, in the King James Version, we have from clay. And in the Psalms, it says that um, God is the master potter and we are jars of clay. So that word clay holds a lot of significance and it's a biblical significance. So one woke once the clays of a cold star. We get the alliteration as well of that uh, k, k sound, usually creating a harsh tone, a cacophonic tone, if you want to use a bigger word than harsh. Our limbs so dear achieved, a sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. So we have this uh, rhetorical question running through these two lines here, these, uh, these run-on lines, lines of enjambment. Our limbs so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warmed, too hard to stir. So it's asking the question, um, is it really that hard to bring back um, this soldier? Um, his sides are still full nerve, still full of, um, full of everything he needs to live, that he's still warm, he hasn't even gone cold yet. Is it really too hard to stir him now? So it's asking that question to, uh, to God and asking why he isn't helping, uh, why he is such a cold, distant star, and why he isn't present and warm uh, like the sun. Was it for this the clay grew tall? And so here we have the a direct biblical allusion. Um, the idea of clay being on the ground and God bringing it up uh, to walk um, like some sort of stalking statues, I guess, um, that he's created us out of the clay. And he's saying, is this the reason you created us, God, just so that we could be dashed like pottery? Oh, what made fatuous? Fatuous is another word for futile, really. Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's sleep, earth sleep at all. And I think at this point, um, we've had that grandfatherly image, the personification of the sun throughout. Um, but these sunbeams um, toiling to break earth's sleep, well, that's what God does in Genesis. Um, that's what God does at the creation of the earth. And so here we've got uh, the persona of the poem asking, what made the futile uh, hands of God work to break our sleep at all? You know, why did God break into this creation if it was all just leading to this? If all of human progress was just leading up to World War I and the pathetic and awful, tragic, pitiful death of this soldier, um, why did he even bother? So that's a brief uh, analysis of Futility by Wilfred Owen.